Hello and welcome to The Robust Marketer. Today, I am thrilled to have a personal friend of mine, Paul Jayapal from Synapse Media Group. I first met Paul when we were both working at GoToMobi, uh, less than a year ago now for both of us, I think. And he since has become a super affiliate, focusing mainly on Facebook, running all kinds of offers from lead gen to CPA to everything in between to agency stuff as well. He came and spoke at Facebook Mastery Live and launched his speaking career, which I'm sure is to take off because he blew everyone away with uh, four amazing tips he gave for people on how to really... It was four techniques that super affiliates are silently using to crush Facebook ads. It's burned into my brain because I'll never forget it. He's a Victoria uh -huh. boy, born and bred. Great to have him on the podcast today. Hello, Paul. How you doing? Good, good. Thanks so much for having me on. And that's quite the intro. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to do the podcast. You know, I uh, when me and Eric were working together at GoTo, I was kind of known as being the guy who... Um, completely loved and was enamored with the internet marketing almost to like a hobbyist sense. So it's really nice to have the opportunity to kind of like chat with other fellow affiliate marketers and really talk about stuff that I enjoy doing. So um, yeah, like I'm, I'm really happy to be on the podcast. I'm ready to, to tune in and share some good info. Nice. Okay, well, let's just start with your marketer's hero's journey. What, what, what brought you to where you are today? Why have you been so obsessed with marketing for, the, for this long? And, and how did you get started? Um, um, like, so I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur and I didn't really even know what the word meant until I was like 15, 16. I started a window cleaning company and I almost fell off a three story building and I quickly realized the, uh, service industry wasn't really for me. Um, and then I started adapting and I really got, um, into more technology based stuff. And it's actually a pretty crazy story. I, uh, I got into internet marketing cause at the time, um, pretty wild story, but I lost a, a bit of money because I ended up investing with some people and got ripped off and I had to kind of go back to square one and square one for me was driving cab and I ended up actually driving the head of an affiliate network, like the owner home one day and I saw that he had like this massive mansion and I was like, what the hell does this guy do for a living? Is that Todd so No, no, it was, no? Uh, it, was, it was Elton. Um, oh, okay, and I, okay. Yeah, so I ended up... Uh, you know, getting his card and being like, hey, like, I really want to learn about technology and what you do. And he totally introduced me to the affiliate uh, industry. And then um, he put me in touch with one of his senior affiliate managers. And she uh, she gave me the, the realism. She was just like 99% of people fail in this industry. So better get ready to like know your odds and get into it. But then I would just drive around in my cab all the time and just listen to podcasts, every single article. Like I read Charles Noe's blog back and forth. I almost knew every thread on STM at the time, like just dug into it knee deep and, and, and got to know it. And then um, I would take half my paychecks from driving cab and just start running affiliate marketing campaigns. And then I eventually got enough experience. I ended up working at uh, GoToMobi with Eric as an internal media buyer. And then I kind of crafted my skills some more and then kind of came time where I was ready to kind of leave and do my own thing. And then uh, I recently set up shop with two other really good friends of mine. And, uh, you know, we've been crushing it since. And it's 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 been quite the journey, you know, a five or six year journey. But that's the thing with affiliate marketing. Like, you know, they say you when you're going through hell, don't stop. That's usually the two or three year mark for most people. And once you come out the other end, that's when you start crushing it. So a lot of lessons learned, but it's been a journey I wouldn't trade for anything else. That's very interesting. And you've also reincorporated your your first gig in that you're also running your own taxi company at this point as well because you found a neat loophole in the market. Yeah, this is kind of like my hilarious go-to of business opportunities. I learn a business insight now and then I go do it on my own. So yeah, like having worked in cab for a couple of years, I ended up actually uh, figuring out how to get the government to give me the licenses. So went through a two-year process and we got like, it hasn't happened where I live in almost like 15 years for people to be awarded new licenses. Um, but we put a huge proposal in front of the government and they awarded it to us. So it's kind of groundbreaking stuff that hasn't happened in a long time. So we're, we're really proud of that. So yeah, if you ever come visit Victoria, the Tiffany blue cabs, they all belong to me. <laughs> they're, they're gorgeous. I, I see them all the time. And I'm, I always look, I'm like, is that Paul? I'm like, oh yeah, no, wait, he's a super affiliate. He's not driving. He's not driving. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't drive there. anymore, but yeah. uh, I luckily get to dial them when I'm intoxicated to take me home. <laughs> yeah, well, that's nice. You got, a, you got a hotline, I'm sure. That's uh, that's always <laughs> handy. Well, I guess you have a couple more years in the cab business until Uber comes. Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> we got a couple years left, and also um, I don't even know if I'll be involved by the time it's, it comes here. So 
Gotcha. Wow. I wanted to talk to you. This is something that you and I share that not a lot of people do. You know, I, I've done some affiliate marketing on my own, but I came up through Neverblue, through the global wide business when it was Neverblue as an internal media buyer. What what made you go from being an, an independent affiliate to, uh, to to an in-house? What was the benefit of being an in-house affiliate when you already were uh, an, a, 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 an on your own affiliate to start? So um, I would say like, you know, a lot of affiliates have this like mentality that if you go to work for somebody, you're not truly an affiliate or whatever that is. Like, I truly don't believe in that because like the um, when you work inside your own bubble, you don't really understand what the benefits of running a large company are. And a big reason that I went to work at GoTo is it wasn't so much the media buying knowledge because like when I got there, a lot like I was... I was a hobbyist, so like I was already like on top of what was working and and all of that. So I wasn't really looking to soak up knowledge in terms of media buying, but truly understand the structure of a startup, right? Like I'm a one person team. What does it take to make thirty million dollars, fifty million dollars, hundred million dollars, and run like you know twenty eight staff or forty staff? That was what was intriguing to me, is because like as a super affiliate, sure you can be the nomad guy that makes like a couple million dollars a year and runs around the world. Um, for me, my personal goal was to build a large company and sell it. So um, for me, it was a, it was an opportunity to work inside an ecosystem that I didn't understand. And you kind of have to, you know, put your entrepreneur hat and take that off and be like, hey, I'm going to be an employee. But at that time, you kind of soak up everything around you. I learned a ton, man. Like I would never trade that experience for anything. Like learning how to work with a team, how to structure having a media buying team, you know, how to take offers laterally, how to run like a, a everything in an organization like having OKRs and teams to manage like that is not shit you're going to learn by yourself trying to be an affiliate you know knocking out campaigns so I felt that it was it was an investment in myself as an entrepreneur to become a better startup owner CEO long-term strategist as opposed to just trying to be a super affiliate and just hone my skills on, on my own. And you answer, you also answered this question. I realized when you talked about your your style of going into a bit of doing a business, figuring it out back to front, and then replicating it yourself in a way, right? Like, and that's really I, I think that's a, such a great answer because there is in, even though it was a bunch of other young people just kind of like building a company, it was it was all people who were your contemporaries. It wasn't like you were going to work for Goldman Sachs or anything like that. But at the same no. time, they were focused on building structures and building things that were repeatable and and scalable, which is a huge lesson to learn. Yeah, and, and at the time when I came in, it, it was only like a handful of guys. I think there was like maybe 10 or 11 people there when I got there. Mm -hmm. And so it, it was like, it was really just starting to explode beyond just like a small team. And, and that was like, I got to watch that from the ground floor going from a small team to like 30 or 40 people, which it's like, you know, if you're trying to do that on your own, it's very challenging. And if you get to watch it one time beforehand, you have a lot of like insights into how you can do that effectively. And, and to speak to the whole like replicating thing, uh, I don't want to no. set, set the precedence that I always copy stuff. But what I like to do is like I like to figure out what's working and add my own flavor to it. So like with the cab industry, we're the only company in town that has exclusively six passenger cars, which made us completely different from what was out in the marketplace. And that's why we started crushing it. Um, when we started media buying, when I left GoTo, GoTo is primarily a mobile company. Uh, I saw a lot of opportunities in the Facebook space, but I took a lot of what I learned about managing media buying teams and uh, how to run a big, bigger business from GoTo and adapted that into what I'm doing uh, with our business. So it's always like, yeah, learn as much as you can, make that your core competency, but then add your flavor, your spin to be your differentiator and then build your business that way. And it's funny, that's like a microcosm for how people talk about running campaigns too. With when you when it comes to something like ad spying, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that's that's what you want to do. You want to survey what's out there, see what's working, and then innovate on ways that you see opportunities in the space. Yeah, exactly. Like I mean, you gotta find like people who try and copycat campaigns, you'll continuously see that like you will get some results, but you won't like the guy who's killing it is like the second or third affiliate to figure it out and just absolutely blow it out of the water. So when you're becoming a media buying team and you're trying to really like kill it, you got to be able to take what you know, but you got to add your own flavor, your own twist to it and, and be able to provide X amount of value on top of what you're already copying in the marketplace. And that can be structural things like how you're, you've set up your accounts. That could be your cash flow, which is better than other people. That would be your relationship you have with an affiliate network or with a specific advertiser so that you, they, you don't have budget or cap concerns. All of those things are ways that you can add value even outside of the, the, the actual campaign. Yeah, and uh, and one thing that I would like really give 
a piece of advice to a lot of affiliates and newer affiliates too is that sometimes there is an advantage uh, behind the scenes that you cannot see. And you got to be very careful of that because when you start chasing the unicorn and you think you can replicate somebody's campaign, but you're not privy to what that invisible advantage is, you can absolutely get blown out of the water. And some sometimes it's like an internal media buying team, right? Like you see something running heavily on pops and you're like, oh man, I could get this to work. But you have no idea that that's actually being run by the internal team who has a 50% discount on the traffic and they're going to absolutely blow you out of the water no matter what. So it, like when I look at campaigns, I'm always trying to figure out like, does this guy have something like could it be an internal team or some advantage that I don't know about before I start trying to go ramp up and chase him um, because it has to be like a level playing field for me in order to figure out if I can beat him and then I also stack up what I have as advantages and figure out is that going to take this campaign you know full blast right that's interesting so speaking of the inv invisible advantage let's just talk a little bit so first of all uh, we really started working together when you came and spoke at FBML, and I gotta say, you know, people keep talking about their favorite uh, talks at the event. You were definitely one of the favorites. You gave very cool. practical, like four. I think you had seven, but you only had time for four super practical tips on on how to really drive amazing results on on Facebook, and and they were they were super good. And because of that, a we're inviting you back to Bangkok, so we're gonna at least get the rest of those Ooh. seven tips. We have a fun time there. <laughs> And then also awesome. we're doing a short acceleration module on the Facebook Masterclass, which launches any day now. Uh, and it's actually called right now the Invisible Advantage uh, Next Level Ad Spying. So talk a little bit about that particular Invisible Advantage. And, and you know, don't give it away yet because we're going to make it an acceleration module that people can purchase. But, but get, t talk about what your sort of methodology is when it comes to spying and how it's different. So like the key thing with spying is that like um, a lot of people – are like it's it's like entrepreneurial nature to be very excited and ready to run and launch a campaign and that's the fun creative part of it but a lot of people end up losing 80 percent of their testing budget because they don't do the due diligence that's required so for me i like to step back like i'd rather do a day or two of intelligence and then run a campaign as opposed to like running it first day and then trying to troubleshoot day two and three because it's not working so and, and i also think that like um like there's some guys out there that really know how to do spying really well. Like one of the top guys I could recommend is like I am Attila. Like he wrote a fantastic guide on STM about mobile spying back in the day. And if you really get in there and learn how to spy properly, uh, you know, it's not just about like one query search and saying, oh, okay, these three ads are here. It's about really digging down and like getting in nitty gritty and finding all the elements that you need and making a, like a plan of attack. It's not just like looking at other people's ads. Like I'll sit down, I'll write out all their copy, I'll check all their targeting, I'll check out all their competitors, check out their volume, like not getting too much into detail. And then I'll create a master plan around, okay, I think these guys are the ones crushing it. This is their approach. This is how we can refine it. Now let's go figure out a plan of attack, right? Because the more of the like the more due diligence you do and the less discovery you do with your own budget, the more likely you are to hit a winning campaign, right? If you spend way too much time trying to dig through the weeds and do it all on your own, you're gonna end up failing. Like copy the guy that's working, but do it well. Like and and go in depth when you're actually trying to find the research on them, right? In order to it, 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 are you basically trying to like are there ways using your spying techniques that you're also trying to figure out what their ad invisible advantage, advantage might be over you? Or is that another part of the process? Um, the I usually just try and figure out like more more or less what their strategy or approach is. And then, um, but like, for example, like the, the, the advantages of like getting pre preferential traffic prices, like that's not really going to happen to you on if you're running on Facebook or Google. Um, that's, that's more if you're like, you know, running on like a third party traffic source. So it, it really depends where, you, where you're spying and what you're looking at. But like, I typically try and figure out their entire approach. And then I also like try and go through the entire flow of how they set it up, not just through like um, what you call it, the just the ad itself. I'll try and track down like the ad landing page, the whole entire flow, mm -hmm. and then check it with a check it with a VPN and just see like, okay, if I was a user, what am I going through here? And try to understand it from uh, start to finish because part of like learning any vertical is understanding why that user is converting and why that flow is working, and then kind of reverse engineering, and then once again adding your flavor or your your kind of expertise on top of that, right? That's interesting. That's something that I see across all of the tips you give is this sort of uh, this idea of like inhabiting your customer's mindset. And if you don't have that customer's mindset, 
going out there and talking to people who do, uh, using YouTube comments on videos and things like that, using all these ways to really like really speak to your audience and really identifying your audience first. It seems it seems like a no brainer, but I bet a lot of people don't do it. Yeah, and like you know, sometimes we forget to use data that's already out there. Like I know, um, you know, with headlines and stuff like that. I posted about this a little while ago on my Facebook page about like you know sometimes trying to discover the best headline. Like everybody wants to be like the Ogilvy of headlines and whatnot, but um, like there's no there's no knocking just like copying a really good headline. And so for me, like sometimes I'll just like use like BuzzSumo or uh, I'll go to Google searches and I'll just use keywords and I'll figure out because Google's algorithm already sorts things with the component of CTR based in, you already can tell kind of what the top performing headlines are. And you can use some of those templates as uh, ideas for your own headlines or BuzzSumo or otherwise, right? So like you don't always have to go inventing your own stuff. And like sometimes trying to be the pioneer will get you killed, right? Like, And so that's why like I try and go for using different tools. Like this is kind of back in the day when I used to run a little bit of adult traffic. I know people would always try and figure out like uh, what banners to use, right? And then what I would do is I would just go to the most viewed videos and just look at the, the thumbnails. And I'm like, well, people are clearly clicking on these names and thumbnails anyways. And then I would try and reorganize my ad to look like the top performing videos, like the thumbnail and the, and the ad copy. So I was like, well, the, the computers are the, their system's already telling you what's the most viewed thing. So why are you trying to figure it out and break their system? Just like copy what's there and adapt it for yourself, right? Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. Um, okay, so we don't have a ton of time here. It's 4.30 on a Friday. I got to head to an island for the weekend, which I'm excited about. But there were three topics that you uh, brought up that you thought would be good to talk about. And I think you were, you were spot on with, with the most relevant thing we could possibly talk about. The number one thing, I think, is this memo. Not a memo. It's, a, it, it's part of their help documentation that Facebook put out, basically as a press release, essentially, where they specifically named cloaking. They specifically talked about the methods that they're going to be using to try to stop this cloaking uh, thing from happening. And everyone knows that Facebook advertisers, advertisers in general, are split into black hat, gray hat, white hat ad advertising. Uh, wh mm -hmm. What does this memo uh, say to you? To, uh, what does it say to black hat advertisers in your mind? Um, the PR press part of it was obviously trying to scare the hell out of all the black hat advertisers. But I think like... The guys who have been in the space long enough know that, like, you know, they've actively been working on this. It's not a secret. Like, everybody knows that, like, new rounds of algorithm changes have been coming. And, and if you compared it to, like, two years ago, it's gotten drastically harder. July so 1st think, was a big thing, right? Like, just July 1st, that first week of July was, like, the night of the long knives. I've heard there was a lot of – a lot of people lost a lot of accounts at that point and have continued to throughout the summer. Yeah, and the thing is, like, Facebook around that time started introducing stuff like uh, the retroactive ad disapprovals. So it used to be that, like, your ads just get approved once and they were off to the races. Now there's some sort of secondary checks going on in the background. So, like, even after your ad's approved, it gets randomly checked and it can get retroactively pulled. Hmm. So they've, they've made a lot of different changes on the back end. And um, my opinion is that, like, yeah, the whole – putting that PR press out there was – hey, we don't want this on our platform. We really care about user experience. And it's kind of like puffing their chest towards the brands. Um, but I also think that like, you know, the most mature ad platforms in the world, like uh, AdWords and GDN, they still have cloaking on them. So like, I mean, th that's like a 15 or 17 year old ad platform and it's still suffering from it from, to this day. So I think that it, it's going to come to a point where it's like, where is it diminishing returns for Facebook, right? Are they really going to employ 15,000 people to go stomp out every black hat ad or is getting rid of 95% of it good enough to maintain user experience? And I think that for them, it, it, they're investing in it because you know, brand dollars don't want to be bidding next to some guy pushing Garcinia. But at the same time, I think it's coming to a point now, like I've seen the circle of people who do this like shrink drastically. And, and I'm pretty confident that the group that's left is probably going to ride out the next few waves. Um, is it going to go, go away completely forever? I, I highly doubt that because like, you know, just as crafty as Facebook engineers are, so are black hat marketers. So they'll find a way to like kind of like go through the, the patterns of figuring out how to, how to get it to work. 
So I, I think it's going to be around, but I think the footprint of Black Hat is definitely going to shrink. And you can already see that people are like running in droves to run e-commerce and all kinds of lead gen stuff because they just can't get Black Hat to work anymore. Like the whole account system is, is totally flawed for them. So you're saying I can't title this email Black or this this podcast Black Hat is dead. That would be too too controversial, maybe. Well, you could, and then the first line of your email has to say almost. Almost, yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that's, that's that's the tactic there. I guess anyway. But but again, yeah. and it's like you know, if you're saying if, if they're going to be able to get rid of ninety five percent of it, I bet you it's going to be more profitable for that five percent that really do ride the waves. Yeah, like I can tell you, by talk, like I talk to people actively who are doing it, and I can tell you ROI is up right now. For everybody that can still maintain uh, standing in that ecosystem, they're doing a lot better than they were before because it's not a bunch of like newbies that are saturating the market trying to do it on their own. It's like very well established guys. And the thing is, like Black Hat three years ago could be a solo operation. Black Hat now is like a team structure. Like you need multiple people to be helping you do it. It's it's not a solo affair anymore. No, and they're well because they're. It's not just they're, they're using a lot of human checks, but they've also just built so you know they, they brag about their algorithm all the time. Uh, I was yeah. just I was talking with Patrick about this this course that that we're putting on, and he was talking about how you know literally if if an, if you run that this is another thing about copying people. If you ad spy someone and you copy it, and it and that ad was banned from someone else, they can just sort of like fingerprint that ad and be like, yeah, that ad was already run. Uh, before it was fraud, you know, it was black hat then, it's black hat now or whatever, and and they can just ban you like that. Yeah, they're doing a lot of like. I'll give you guys two interesting insights. So the image signature thing has been around for a while, and um, the way most people get around that is like, for example, if you take a video that's been banned and you just like process it through Premiere Pro and you just change it from like you know MP4 to like a different video format and you add like a gradient filter or something, they'll throw off the signature. Um, so it produces a brand new signature, and that's how people are getting stuff through. Um, but Facebook has gone way beyond that, man. Like now they're doing, uh, what Google has been doing for lots of years, which is they're actually taking a cache copy of your website. So they can tell if you clone a brand new site and just throw up all the same content, they can see that that footprint was uh, already banned somewhere else on their network. So they've got a lot of like the, the AI stuff is getting more and more sophisticated. Um, you know, but the, the, the double edged sword on that is. The more you look like a real user account, the harder it is for them to find you, right? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. So the way that I see this happening is it's going to filter out the newbies, unless like unless they're being taken, you know, under the wing of, of very established black hat people. Newbies getting into the space, thinking they can get into black hat, it's going to become harder and harder for them to do that. So what do you think then? is their best opportunity in the space for newbies coming in that there, there isn't that easy path, maybe, you know, or there, it's no longer an easy path because of all the technology, all the know how you need to have in order to play that cat and mouse game with Facebook. For, so newbies coming in, you know, what do you feel is the best opportunity for them at this point? I honestly think that e-commerce is probably like the best place to go. I know it's pretty saturated. It's like kind of a, like a hot topic and everybody's doing it. But in terms of the learning curve, just the, the pure amount of resources that Shopify allows users to have, like just in their like knowledge database or whatever, there's so much information there that it's enough to get you started. Um, you know, the real difficulty with becoming like a like a like a regular affiliate marketer is you gotta learn tracking, you gotta learn hosting, you gotta learn landing pages. Like there's like a million things you gotta dial in and be half decent at in order to start crushing like regular campaigns. Um, whereas you know with Shopify, if your pixels integrated, you don't even need a tracker. You can get off to the races. Um, so I think that like you know if I was to get into this space today, I would be focused like on spending you know you know five or ten grand trying to rock out a Shopify store and get that going. Um, but like I said, it's uh, if you're if you're in internet marketing for the long haul, Shopify is hot right now. Um, but you know, lead gen and doing like uh, cost per sale and all kinds of uh, Facebook opportunities are going to be here for the long haul. So if, you know, if you are dedicated to being in the industry for a long period of time, it is worthwhile looking at those other opportunities uh, because you know, there's you can make twenty to thirty grand a day pushing finance. You can do it doing like refi. You can do all kinds of verticals, uh, solar like that can work on Facebook, right? Yeah, no, that, that's that's interesting, and I feel like Shopify is is the what's really hot right now. This idea of drop shipping, I think it, the same thing is going to happen at a rapid, more rapid pace where people figure it out. Facebook, I think, has already had rumbles about like 
uh, putting in limitations on sh on shipping times, for instance, which might take a huge section of the people who are drop shipping from Alibaba sort of out of the races because the shipping time won't be sort of in line enough to keep the user experience high. But it's just like anything else. If you can, if you're investing in in learning affiliate marketing, you can invest in. Uh, e-commerce from maybe a deeper perspective, maybe where you're actually sourcing products. Maybe that's the way I see Shopify and dropshipping is it's people that can like get a few quick hits, get some wins while they're maybe investing in a longer term strategy when it comes to e-commerce. Like that involves product sourcing and, and the whole the whole gamut. Yeah, I think like with the e-commerce thing, there's a couple things that I see coming. And like I said, the shipping thing is definitely one of them. Um, I've noticed that like uh, if you take a look through most of the Shopify stores that are being run, Facebook's running surveys on the back end to say like, hey, was your product delivered? Were you satisfied? Blah, blah, blah. All that tracks back to your ad account. So if somebody says like, oh, I haven't got my product in like 60 days or whatever, um, it's going to cause a lot of issues. And like, you know, we, we already started running some Shopify stores. And what we've noticed is even when we, we offer two to seven day shipping, sometimes 15 day shipping, and we have people within two days like messaging us being like, where's my product? So if they're impatient on like a seven to ten day window, I can't imagine that how much they're gonna freak out at the you know thirty to sixty days where some of these e packet products are coming from. And so I think shipping is gonna be a huge thing, and I definitely think Facebook's gonna come down and say like, hey, if you guys can't deliver stuff within like fifteen days to you know three weeks, like get your stuff together, get your logistics together. We probably don't want you on the platform. Because the way Facebook looks at it is uh, people start blaming Facebook. They don't like people don't fully comprehend that it's a third party company mm -hmm. selling something through Facebook. So they ended up messaging Facebook support and blasting them saying, I didn't get my product. So I definitely think shipping is going to be one of the things that are going to tighten up. Also, I think there's going to be a big push to get rid of like uh, borderline health products out of Facebook stuff that's like, you know, like I already know that they started banning uh, black mask. Um, because there's people who are getting rashes and stuff like that. So when you're seeing certain products that you know might have like uh, a skin reaction or a health reaction coming out of China, I think they're going to be a little bit more stringent on the vendors that they let through. Maybe if you're like a U.S. manufacturer of it and you can provide your like FDA approvals and all your note, like all your packaging information and all the data to back it up, maybe you can run. But I highly doubt they're going to in the future let like a bunch of affiliates or Shopify owners push like. Uh, borderline health products that could cause skin issues because Facebook doesn't need that blowback in the media. So I think stuff like that is going to be changing. And I also think that like uh, the days of like random general stores are probably going to get hit too because uh, people don't trust like a random site that sells like everything from like, you know, watches to like, uh, you know, charging cords and like 10,000 products. Um, I think it's going to be more the, the businesses that survive and the Shopify stores that survive are people that are going to be building real brands. Um, that are invest in the long haul, right? Like I think modeling yourself after like, I think it's called MVT watches or whatever, mm. like those kind of big brands. If you try and become those, you're going to succeed. But if you're trying to like exploit the overnight drop shipping, um, that window is closing pretty tightly. That's interesting. So this makes me, so one, so I have a couple questions. One, I have a, a question about you, about your, your sort of procedure for product sourcing. Like what are, do you have any insights you can give on, on how people can go about picking a product to sell on e-commerce? So I don't do it typically the way that everybody else does it. Um, our team, the way we, fo <laughs> the, our team focuses on doing it a completely different way, which is that uh, we try and look at who the top spenders on Facebook are and what kind of products they're pushing and then identify verticals where like we know advertisers are spending 30 to $40 million. So it's not about trying to find like a, a breakthrough product that just like is hot for 30 days. It's about finding verticals that are proven that we know like time and time again are going to generate 20 to $30 million online on Facebook and then trying to come up with our own skew of brand that can go and compete with that and then jump in there. But we'll also like, you know, We'll model what the the leading person is doing to a T and change out the products, change out everything else, like all the images on the site, run that and see if we can catch up to them or break even and then start building on top of that. Oh, that's interesting. So my other question about e-commerce was what are some of the innate – so when, when we're – you know, I, I came from the, the STM family, the Affiliate World Conference, iStack – where we're traditionally we've been focused on this affiliate marketer and specifically affiliate media buyer sort of uh, mm -hmm. sort of verticals where you know where we come from the pops and the display and and even to the Facebook and search and everything like that. But the thing about e-commerce is people have been coming at it for the past five years from a totally other perspective because 
the barrier to entry is so low. So they've been going after housewives and and stay at home moms and dads and people who who aren't hardcore affiliates who know how to arbitrage clicks. These are people that that just are internet savvy, and these are the people that have been really making the biggest splash when it comes to e-commerce. So affiliates who are jumping into it late, maybe they're coming from Black Hat, maybe they're coming from other traffic sources where they've had a, a lot of difficulty making things work. What are some of the sort of innate advantages that affiliates have to catch up to these people that have been doing it for the past five years? I think um, a lot of the advantages that come from being an affiliate is understanding like conversion optimization, like um, understanding like what different apps and stuff that you can use to increase the conversion rate on your, on your page. And also understanding that like uh, affiliates are really savvy at running on multiple channels, right? Like the, if you are completely dedicated to making your Shopify store a success, it's probably not, it's in your best interest to not just be running Facebook traffic, but running, you know, uh, GDN if you can get it to work, running on Yahoo Gemini, and then also, you know, running a, a sequential like email campaign to go with it, retargeting, like the, I would imagine the, the the advantage an affiliate has is being able to set up a Shopify store so much more comprehensively than just some mom and pop who's kind of reading through the Shopify, uh, like, you know, base tutorials and stuff like that. Affiliates really understand like the end to end funnel perspective of things and also the, what they can do with the, the data that they get afterwards. Right? Like if you have like a, a 10,000 person email list, you can now start hammering them email campaigns to try and generate more revenue. And they can, I would believe that affiliates are much better at monetizing the entire Shopify ecosystem that they put together a lot better than regular, uh, regular advertisers, like just people that are mom and pop shops. I think that's interesting. I think there's probably a little caveat there, which is because I know a lot of affiliates, it, it does require a mind shift, uh, a mindset shift to, to tackle the consumer throughout their length, right? Like I, I know a lot of affiliates throughout, in, in my experience dealing with them, are more about that quick arbitrage of click to conversion, less concerned about the way things play out over time. But that's something that you just have to be focused on uh, when you're selling a product, when you're building a list. You've got to focus on the, the full lifetime value of a consumer and wringing out as much value as you can. Yeah, and that's the other thing too, is like what, what philosophy are you bringing to your store, right? Are you trying to just do a smash and grab and make like as much money in the next two weeks? Eclipse or glasses right now. <laughs> are, are you are you focused on really building like a, a real brand, right? Like a lot of the people on uh, AliExpress or pushing AliExpress products, they don't even consider that they could take a product and possibly make it better or add their own spin to it or get an exclusive line or do certain things where they can actually build a real brand out of it, right? Because like the rest of the world that isn't drop shipping, they're all doing um, like different things with the with the opportunities, right? They could be going to actually distribute real products to different stores and developing their own lines. This is totally possible with what you're doing, right? Interesting. This question is out of the blue, so we may have to edit it out if you don't have an answer for it. But <laughs> Akatif uh, in my last podcast, which which I'm, I'm happy because it's going to hopefully be a tidal wave where we can get uh, a lot of he's views. A from, beast. He's a beast, but he's almost at a thousand views on YouTube already from from our podcast that we just released earlier this week. So, uh, but awesome. his his whole thing is thinking about things in five year increments, where you really want to think about where you are now, where you want to be in five years, and you backdate your plan sort of to get you to where you want to go. I know you guys have your hands in all sorts of different things. What's your general idea of where you'd want to be with your company in five years? Um, my vision for having our company in five years is to be like, you know, hopefully 50 to like 100 employees and three divisions, right? Like focused on owning our own e-commerce brands, uh, focused on some core niches like uh, in specific verticals where we're some of the largest uh, volume lead generators and then having a division that's uh, exclusively R&D where we're trying to figure out, you know, either build a, a traffic source or some sort of technology that would uh, allow us to kind of like get a better valuation for the business overall. Um, that's kind of been our guiding light. Um, like it's it's difficult as a an affiliate media buying business. A lot of the times you're focused on cash flow and generating capital now. Uh, but Akatif is dead on, man. You, you gotta have like uh, it's interesting. Um, they referred to it in Facebook in the early days as your guiding light, your northern star. What's your northern star principle? Like how are you? Let's have this one question that like dictates every decision that goes on in the company. And at the time, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's was like, is this going to help us grow our user base? And it doesn't matter if it was going to make them like 10 grand that day or a million dollars that day. This question was, is it going to help us grow our user base? 
And for us, we look at it as like, is this going to become an asset to the business? Is this going to be like something that's going to help us sell the company in, you know, five or 10 years? Or is this just going to be like a massive cash cow now, but it develops no assets, right? Because there is a cash value there, but like what you don't make today, you can make up on the back end by building technology in a real business. So like instead of making 500K in the next three weeks running a certain campaign that's hot, if you build your traffic source, it could start making 500K a month, but you may not see it for two years. So it really depends what you want to do, right? And for us, like we don't want to be just a media buying house forever. Uh, we really want to develop into a technology company and also focused on riding the long-term wave of e-commerce, which I think is going to be around for the next 10 years. Nice. And how big are you now? Right now we have uh, the three co-founders and we have about six or seven people that work for us mainly on contract basis. Okay. Um, but we're going to be doing our first couple hires in the next few months. Nice. Very exciting. Yeah. Cool. Well, it's, it sounds like you're definitely in line with the Akatif school of school of thought there. He's definitely <laughs> yeah. a, a good person to uh, to kind of be in the same boat with, I think. No, he's he's got it down. Like, and I totally like got a lot of respect for that guy because he's been through the trenches and uh, he's made a lot of the same mistakes that affiliates continually make over and over again. So to hear it from like the OG that tells you like this is what you got to do, it's it's always I'm always a. Uh, Ears perked whenever Akatif has uh, some sort of knowledge to share. Yeah, or or a bottle of champagne, as I like to bring. <laughs> um, yeah. so, so speaking of shit, there's one topic we'll get to at the end here. But I won't, this is another question that that came out of left field. It was something that that I enjoyed with uh, talking with Jason about. But it's this idea of lifestyle. It's the idea of like why we do what we do. And I've seen you indulge getting into. First of all, you're building your own brand. So I don't know if you're looking for Facebook followers, but you. But maybe give that out at the end of the the podcast. But you're you're posting really interesting things. I've seen a few uh, F1 you know, champagne bottle popping actions going on. But <laughs> but what is it that what's one of the things that you, that you like love that you're doing outside of work that you're that that you that you know your success in what you're doing allows you to do anything yet? Or are you just fo- to- totally focused on the grind? Oh, um, you know. Work does take up a good chunk of the day, um, but for me, it's just having the freedom to like explore. Like one thing that's been really rewarding for me is like uh, just all my experience in internet marketing has allowed me to help a lot of startup founders. So like whenever I get to meet somebody that has like an idea, like I always like get to share with them like, well, here's a user acquisition perspective on this, or this is like my media buying perspective on this, and it's it's really helpful because like I've gotten to shape some apps and different ideas and help people figure out you know how to take something to market and I think going into the future one thing that I hope to do is like I want to get into the investing game where I get to like not only just like you know kind of check on like a a seed round or something like that but be actively involved in shaping products and helping people grow I think that's really exciting and that's one thing that I would love to grow as a hobby is being involved in other startups because like when you surround it with people with the same energy as you want to build and be involved in online marketing and do cool things. It's like, it's, it's a really uh, exhilarating like arena to be playing in. Right. That's still work. <laughs> but, it's still, but it sounds good. It, it, it feels like playing. <laughs> yeah. No, that's fair. Uh, nice. Okay. So this last topic you brought up is something that I had just have a little bit experience of because um, I kind of got really enamored with the idea of influencer networks uh, when I was at GoToMobi, actually, we were talking about kind of trying to put something together. And I've done some dabbling in the space. And there's there's some parallels between affiliate marketing. And, and to me, it was like, okay, this is like an organic style of affiliate marketing where people aren't going to be buying traffic. They're going to have these networks of things that have built up. And But but then I started talking to these influencers and they, they're not savvy like affiliates. They were like, pay me $100 and I'll tweet this or pay me $100,000 like uh, – like one of the Kardashians yeah. or whatever, and I'll tweet this. But what do you see going on in the space here? And what do you see uh, as some of the, the things coming up in the space of influencer marketing? So it sounds like a pretty scary thing to say, but I do think that influencer marketing is going to get killed. <laughs> I think it's probably like got, yeah, I think it's probably got maybe like a year, year and a half left at that. It could, it could be as like as fast as like a couple months. Um, the reason I say this is like, I used to actively run like very large Facebook pages and back uh, like a few years ago, Facebook rolled out their update, absolutely crushed. Like I had pages that were doing like actively one to 2000 likes per post. And then the rollout came out and you know, you're lucky to get it like a hundred likes, like things are just getting crushed. And I just don't see it happening where like, there's no, 
equation where somebody is like reselling free traffic that Facebook's giving you, that Facebook's going to be okay with that. And so I think what's going to happen is Facebook's going to take a chunk of the pie. Like they're either going to just like they charge you to boost posts. They can. I, I think they've already started developing something where you can actually like do influencer marketing, but it's going to be through their paid channels. Um, but the what's going to actually happen for Instagram influencers is when they cut that traffic, they don't have anything to have of value to offer advertisers. So tomorrow, if the algorithm that applies to Facebook fan pages gets slapped on the, the Instagram uh, ecosystem, then all these people's reach is just going to just topple. And once that happens, how are you going to charge $1,500 a post? You have no reach. And then at that point, it makes more sense as an advertiser to go boost a post than to go pay an influencer because you probably get better reach at a better price than to try and go through somebody else. So I think that like the it's interesting. It's really hot right now, and it's still working. Don't get me wrong. Like At the current uh, time we're, we're looking at it, it's, it's really hot. It's working. But I think there's, like a, there's a ticking time bomb on that, and it's about to go out. What was your post actually about? Was it about Kendall Jenner and how much she makes per? Yeah, so I, I from what I understand, she makes anywhere in the realm of like a couple hundred thousand up to 600K per post. And that's because she has 97 million followers on Instagram. Um, but it's like a co-branding deal. But at the same time, like I was talking to uh, the people that were managing some of her Shopify stores. And they were saying that like the transaction volume is just insanity when she tweets or like puts up a post. It like works. they 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 have Shopify guys sitting there trying to load balance just to try and deal with their traffic. Oh my god! So well, I heard yeah. she, I heard she stopped a riot with just a can of Pepsi. So she obviously <laughs> she obviously has a huge amount of power. So, but you okay? Yeah. So you're saying and and they're basically going to do this because they want their cut. They're not getting their cut currently. They're, they're, all of this free traffic is is going out there, so it's it's just a matter of time before before it goes. Well, just think about it this way: it's like you, somebody's giving you free cable, and you're turning around and selling it to your neighbors, right? Eventually, the cable company's going to get pissed off, <laughs> and uh, that's kind of the way to look at this: is just that, like you know, free traffic is not going to be free traffic for long unless you own it through like some sort of SEO property. Um, but I highly doubt that, like you know, Facebook is cool with you taking their thousands of impressions and clicks and packaging it up under your banner and selling it to people when they can just easily cut you out and so there's no real value exchange there in the long term and i also think that it's going to be very interesting to see what the shakeup is because uh influencers are going to have to reinvent themselves um what a value of an influencer is going to completely change and it's going to be a real shakeup in the marketplace but i think that you know just like people had built entire businesses around Facebook fan pages thinking that that volume of traffic was always going to be there. When that wave came through, it crushed people and bankrupted them. It's going to happen again with Instagram influencers. So like if you don't have some sort of backup traffic, whether it's like through a YouTube channel, an email list, somewhere else where you can reach your fans, the day they pull your plug on you, you have nothing to offer advertisers. You have no reach because essentially you're a traffic source and you're getting paid to be advertising on your traffic sources, which is your channel, your Instagram channel. And once that goes away, you have nothing to offer. So does that mean Kendall Jenner will no longer be able to reach her 97 million people at that point? Like it's, it's crazy because the power imbalances have, or the power has gotten so out of control where there are influencers that have just this inordinate amount of power. And you think, you think Instagram could just pull the plug on them one day? So I think there's like a delicate balance in doing this. Like I think that the algorithm, like what I've noticed is like the algorithm, it, it does apply to everybody, but it, there's like certain thresholds that can be beaten if you have like a huge account. Um, like for example, like I noticed that like if you have a certain account and you get something like retweeted or shared at, at enough velocity, it kind of tends to take off on its own. Um, but I've noticed that like pages like Kevin Hart, who has 23 million people on Facebook, even he got hit by the, the algorithm update, right? Like he had a massive following. Like I noticed that like some of his like uh, earlier videos that had like uh, 3 million views had like something like 70,000 shares. And then now the same kind of viewership, like if it gets a million views, the video, he's like got like 8,000 shares or something. So it hits, it hits across the board. Um, I think just the sheer size of Kendall Jenner's following and the fact that it's dispersed across so many platforms or sorry kylie jenner well they're all they all have huge followings right yeah but like just the fact that it's dispersed across like uh multiple channels like they have instagram snapchat and all these other places i think they'll be able to ride it out um but i'm not sure when it's going to happen for the people 
the other thing too is you have to consider that the Jenners have a brand, right? Like they're really well known. It's just like Joe Schmo models that don't really have a brand but have a huge following. Those are the ones that are going to get hurt the worst. All you need is for your dad to become transgender and, <laughs> and your mom to, yeah, yeah. You just need a, you just need a yeah, really historic family with a lot of fucked up issues. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to my mom tonight about that. But uh, anyways, Paul, it's been <laughs> awesome having you on the, uh, on the podcast today. I got to run. Yeah, but to, to, so to recap here, uh, you can catch Paul uh, on the FBML replay if you want to see his performance from Berlin. You can catch him on the upcoming Facebook Masterclass where he's doing uh, the Invisible Advantage, a sort of next level acceleration module on ad spying. And you can catch him again in Bangkok where he's going to be presenting at Facebook Mastery Live in Asia. And then for your personal stuff, uh, it's Synapse Media. That's synapsemediagroup.com. Um, it's synapsemediaonline.com. That's our company website. So if you guys are looking for anybody to do agency spend or anything like that, give us a shout. And then you can also follow me. I have a, a Facebook page. Just look up Paul uh, J. Pal or Paul J. on Facebook and you'll find my page. I post a lot about like uh, internet marketing and what I see coming down the pipe for Facebook advertisers and all kinds of stuff. So follow me if you're interested in that kind of thing. Nice. And Paul is just another reason why Victoria, B.C., is the place to be when it comes to performance advertising. I love it. Yeah, for sure. Nice, man. Okay, right, cool. thanks. We'll, we'll, thanks we'll keep so an eye out for those turquoise cabs. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Okay, see you, Paul. All right, cheers. Bye. Bye.